Hey folks, I'm Dave Politis, and this is my YouTube channel, uh, The Can-Am Missing Project. It's a copyrighted broadcast licensed to this channel. And if you're seeing this on another channel other than The Can-Am Missing Project, please report it as a copyright violation. Today we're going to talk about some uh, interesting things that you have submitted, some questions and answers, and right off the bat, let's talk about my second movie, Missing 411 The Hunted. A lot of questions came in about the association with the Predator movie, with Arnold. And many of you missed it, but if you pay close attention when you watch the movie on iTunes, Amazon, you're going to see that the music is very similar to the Predator music. Key on that. Also, in the movie, the soldiers, Arnold's group, was talking about Green Berets. Now, if you are read my books, you'll know why the Green Berets are associated with some of these cases. Now, what's the difference between Green Berets and other, other soldiers? It's an important aspect. Why would Green Berets be brought in instead of the local National Guard? Well, the local National Guard are locals, and they're friends of the community, they're husbands, etc., wives. And if they get interviewed by the press, they're probably going to talk. Green Berets sign a secrecy oath. They won't talk. So there's one big reason why the Green Berets may be brought in on some of these searches. In the movie, Arnold's group also talks about the thing left no tracks. Something else similar in our work. And lastly, they said, it's like these guys just disappeared. Well, how many times have you read that in the books? So, yeah, there are a, little, a lot of similarities in the Predator movie, the saran wrap image going through the trees. Well, in that movie that we made, that's exactly where this thing was seen, going tree to tree, just like in the Predator movie. So, it's a good start. A lot of people have asked, well, Dave, where can I write to you? Where can I see your website? Well, the screen you're looking at right now on your computer, right below that, it says Read More, and if you click on that, it has our website, contact information, etc., all listed, so it's right there for you. Some people have questioned the persona of the people that go missing. And that's a real interesting point that I bring up in several of the books. What do I mean by that? I mean, what kind of person goes missing? Is it uh, the local town drunk? Is it the local drug dealer? Is it some drug addict? No, it's not. It's like the good people of the world. It's the highly educated. It's the athlete. It's the people that you really wouldn't think would end up in those positions. So I've thought of that often, and it's almost like a good versus evil. Is it the evil and the good people are missing? It's been brought up by many of my readers. Another question, have SAR personnel gone missing? Yes, they have, and I write about those in the books. Another thing is the condition of the bodies. Dave, uh, I know a lot of people have gone missing and their bodies have been mutilated. <laughs> Wrong. In fact, I've written about almost 13, 1,400 people now that have gone missing, and really none of their bodies have been mutilated. I would say 99.5% have no injuries on them except what was maybe caused their death. They fell, something like that. But in general, there's no injuries, there's no sexual molestation, there's no sexual assault. So think about that clearly. Now, there are cases out there that some people have read about that have contacted me that say that, oh yeah, this person disappeared and they were found mutilated. And I've dug into some of those stories, and I found no credibility in them. And I mean none. And I've gone out and I've dug through a lot of cases, and I'm sure some of you are going to show some to me, but I'm talking about North American cases. No police reports, no state police reports, no federal police reports. And some of the conspiracy people would say, oh yeah, you know, it's just being held from us. Folks, let's get something straight. Local police and sheriffs are not going to be intimidated by federal law enforcement. I was there. We would tell them to go stick it. 
because they have no control over us. A, a sheriff, especially a rural sheriff, is a very, very independent type. If the feds try to push him around, he'll just say, hey, get out of my county. He doesn't care. She doesn't care. So any thought that the feds could come into an area and start to control it and control the flow of information, no. Incorrect. And if you watched our movie, Hunted, Missing 411, The Hunted, you'll see some sheriffs in there that are talking straight off the cuff, telling you exactly how they feel about these cases, how uncomfortable they are. So don't believe that. A lot of people asked about psychics. I have a good story about psychics. I was at a conference, I was speaking at it, and there was a huge hall with a lot of vendors. One entire aisle, probably 12 deep, was nothing but psychics. And I'd go by there during the day and people were there by the hundreds, getting, getting their background read by these people, etc. They were making a lot of money. At the end of the conference, when they were picking up <coughs> their stuff, I went down there and I spoke to each one, handed out my business card. About half of them actually knew who I was because I was speaking there. And I explained how I wanted to work with them. We we're still looking for missing people, working for credible people to work with, avenues to experiment, etc. Oh, yeah, yeah, Dave. Um, everyone said they were interested. I said, yeah, we'll get with you. Give me a week, blah, blah, blah. Folks, do you know how many of those psychics contacted me? None. Not one psychic has contacted me off that list that I contacted them, proactively, trying to look for some help. Now let's pretend you were a psychic and you had these abilities. How better to serve the world and the families of the missing than going to find somebody who's missing? How much work can it really take if you have those abilities? A phone call, an email to me? Let's get on it. But it doesn't happen. And we've talked about this as a team. Why aren't these people contacting us? Because we'll hold them accountable. I don't think they're going to get by with a lot of garbage getting thrown at us. We're going to get right to the nitty gritty. They're not going to play these name games or these language games with us. It's going to be straightforward. So do I believe in psychics? Yeah, I do. Because I actually know some cops from decades ago that worked with some psychics that are no longer alive that did uh, help them find <coughs> some, uh, some victims. So yeah, I think that it does exist. Few and far between. What about remote viewers? Why have you been sold so much on remote viewers? Well, number one, they do a tremendous job in their presentations, because I've seen them. They do a great job, some of the best I've ever seen. And they also do a great job on selling their services to people who want to be remote viewers. Great job! Now, folks, I want you to be a critical thinker. I personally have looked hard to see what these people have done lately. Again, what better service could they do for the community than to go out and find somebody who's missing. Now, one remote viewer that I saw at a conference, I contacted them, tried to work with them. Kind of seemed like they didn't want to work with us. Somewhat evasive. Finally got them down. They did a reading. It wasn't even the same hemisphere. It was so far off it was ridiculous. And he said he'd try again. Same thing happened. Another remote viewer that I contacted. Both these people are pretty famous. And I asked them right off the cuff if uh, they've ever found somebody who's missing. And they said yes. And I asked for a name. They gave it to me. And I con contacted the spouse of this person who's missing. And the spouse said that uh, this individual did nothing to find their, their missing victim. And they're pretty adamant about it. So I didn't even contact them anymore. But again, I go back to trying to do some good on the earth. Trying to be a good person. If 
if a psychic or a remote viewer can go find one person I've written about, just one, I will dedicate working with them and letting you know and everybody else around the world know they found somebody. And I think that'd be a pretty good validation. And I've said this at every conference I've been at for the last five years. Again, nobody's ever been found. So if these people have abilities, I don't understand why they're not using them for the good of humanity. Because I have a long line of victims' families that are distraught, saddened, lives are destroyed because they can't get closure on their life because their, their loved one's gone. It's horrible. I, I can't think of a worse fate. So enough of that. Talk about missing people in Pennsylvania. Somebody asked me, are there any people missing in Pennsylvania? Oh my gosh. There's a chapter just on Pennsylvania and missing 411 Eastern US. And I outline the largest group of missing children of any state anywhere by a factor of three or four. So many people missing there, it's ridiculous. In subsequent books, I even added to that number. So yeah, lots of missing people in Pennsylvania. Some of you have asked me to do a podcast. I'm humbled that you asked. Thank you. In reality, there's no way I could do a podcast. I get up every morning and make a commitment to myself that I'm going to go above and beyond what I did the day before and be a better person and try to do a better job than I did yesterday. I never want to be mediocre at anything I do. In a podcast, I know myself that I'd spend five hours on a half hour podcast, five hours of prep. I don't have that time. Unfortunately, I just don't. And this right here is going to be my commitment to you to communicate on a regular basis. Podcasting, I can't do it. I will get out there every once in a while and I'll interview somebody for you that's important to me. But thank you for being interested enough in asking me. Now lately, there's been a huge influx of people commenting on the site. Many of these people are not good people. They have said some things about you and about me that are horrific. My guarantee to you, those people aren't gonna bully you off the channel and they're not gonna bully me. This is your channel and my channel to communicate and to talk about important issues, missing people. And if these people think that they're going to speak out, call you and me names, and act like fools, then folks, they're going to have to go get their own channel because they're not going to do it on mine. And I'm kind of getting sick and tired of it. But that's okay. Because we got it under control. So feel safe in saying anything you want. Just don't be rude to people. And we're going to get it together right here. And we're going to continue to do it. My promise to you. Now, one of the things that uh, I promised I'd talk about in this broadcast is the distance traveled by young children. And I made a point in the early books to highlight this for you because I wanted people to understand right from the beginning this is unusual. A lot of single people who haven't been around children have a difficult time absorbing this. Married people don't. And when I go to a conference, I ask everybody in the room where I ask kids to raise their hand because I want to get a grasp on how many people out there are going to get this. Now, in the first movie, Les Stroud, Survivor Man, did a segment for me and he tried to replicate a trip of a two-year-old, nine miles in 12 hours over two mountain ranges and over barbed wire fences. The boy was eventually found alive, barely, face down in some snow. We interviewed him, found him. Later in life, he said he had no recollection of the incident at all. Has no idea how he did it. But the important point and why we use Les is Les is a mountain man. Spent, spent his whole life in the mountains. 
There's no bigger stud for hiking through the hills than Les. And in the middle of that recording, when he stopped us and said, Dave, I can't do this. There's no way this boy did this. And he reminded me that he said, Dave, nine air miles is usually about 18 to 27 walking miles because you don't walk a straight line anywhere in the mountains. And remember that. That was Les's point. So the boy didn't walk just nine miles. So how did he do it? And that was the point of that first movie, is to highlight a series of kids, their disappearance, and how unreasonable it is that they made these trips themselves. I don't have the answers on how they did it, but it was a point to get you thinking. So let's go over a few of these that I put in uh, Missing 411 Devils in the Detail. How about a four-year-old boy, 45 miles in five days? Possible? How about a four-year-old, 40 miles in four days? Four-year-old, 30 miles in three days? A two-year-old, 20 miles in three days? A two-year-old, 15 miles, three days? Two-year-old, 15 miles found in a cave? Lastly, a three-year-old, 15 miles in 30 hours. Folks, I'm sorry. It's pretty unbelievable in my book. <coughs> Each one of those stories, in fact, every story in my book, there's a citation exactly where the information came from. So you can go look if you want to. Why is that important to me? Because when I read a book with no citations where the information came from, makes me question if it was even true. And that's why when you look through my book and you look at the online reviews, there's hardly anything on there about this type of information or questioning it. Now, all of these cases, there were no roads around. This is wilderness. So keep that in mind. Promise I have in every video I make, if I get a good mail, you're going to get it. And there's some good mail this week. So, first one. Dear Mr. Pledge, thank you for your fascinating, disturbing reporting on disappearances in North America parks and wilderness. I have noted that I have noted that, that case reports, especially that those been relating to public submissions to you, have a degree of variety, many including premonitions of danger. It appears if the reports are reliable that whatever agency or agencies are responsible for this phenomena has a degree of control over our central nervous system and it's being exercised, including perhaps communication as well as compulsion. It occurred to me after hearing of these incidents that an experience of mine may be important. It happened as a small boy. Perhaps not. There are certainly many possibilities possibilities and explanations, but my subjective experience left no doubt in my mind that something extraordinary happened, or almost happened. Let me explain and you be the judge. I know you're busy, so I apologize if this misses the mark. When I was 10 or 11 in the early 80s, my family and I lived on a 165 acre parcel just north of Quisnell, BC, British Columbia. It was a pretty place sitting on a glacier carved shelf above the Quisnell River. My dad was a paramedic working for the provincial ambulance service and worked in town. My mom was a stay-at-home wife and homemaker. I had been experiencing a recurring dream. I never remembered it, but always woke up feeling certain that I had had it. And it left me feeling odd, like something had happened during the night, but I couldn't remember. I had the dream several times over three to four weeks. I was never left feeling disturbed or fearful, just filled with certainty that something significant had happened. I assumed it was a dream, and in fact, I remembered small flashes, fragments, or images. They were, they were always the same, a specific location on our land. Then one morning I woke and knew that I had the dream again, but that something important was going to happen today. I knew it. I didn't know how I knew, but I was filled with absolute certainty that not only was my sequence of repeated dreams concluded, but that something of tremendous importance was going to happen to me today. Nothing. Nothing I was so certain about would ever be the same. I wanted it to happen, whatever it was. I wanted it more than anything. 
I had ever wanted before. It was coming for me soon. My mom told me over breakfast that she was going to go into town that morning, and the moment she said it, I knew that it was going to happen today. I then understood that for it to happen, she needed to go. <coughs> I could barely keep my anticipation off my face. It wasn't excitement, it was more like an expectant tension. I needed this to happen. I kept my face neutral because I knew my mom needed not to know. Then my mom looked at me strangely and hesitated. She said, no, I'll stay home today, go in tomorrow. Okay, stop for a second. Was mom's intuition kicking in and saying, I better not go? Was she reading something in her, <coughs> in her son's face? Who caused her to say that? Back to the story. I was crushed. I tried nonchalantly to encourage her to go, but she wouldn't budge. And I knew that whatever it was, was not going to happen. Not ever. The certainty of that morning was never... <coughs> Excuse me. I'm getting over a cold. Nor did, <coughs> Nor did I ever have that dream again. If that was it, it was done. I have no idea what, if anything, would have happened if my mom had gone into town. But something tells me I would not be writing this email, nor do I think I would have been there waiting when she returned. It taunted me my entire life. Thank you for hearing my story. I know it could have been a vagary of my mind, and I cannot prove it was something else. But I damn well know something strange was happening, or was about to happen. I just know it. I wish I knew what. Thanks again. Good luck in your investigation. Stay safe. Now, I, I turned around and I asked this person, if they ever had that dream again, or they ever had that premonition again, and they said no. Now, is that that sixth sense kicking in by mom? And are things told to us in a dream that could become reality? And the answer is yes. How do I know that? Because I've written three stories in the books about people who had dreams about missing people. They went out and told others and took those others exactly to where the people were missing. Some of these people lived in a completely different part of the state, had nothing to do with the victim. So I think something, something's happening there that we don't understand, but it's factual. And uh, I, some of you say, oh yeah, well they probably killed the person. Yeah, no, that wasn't the case. The law enforcement cleared each of them. In fact, they gave a polygraph to one and completely passed, so that isn't it. Okay, one more story. My name is blank, blank, blank. I've read a great deal of your writings, watched one of your movies so far, and plan to watch the other and read the rest of your books soon. Please keep up the great work. I think what you're doing is vitally important. I will try to be as exact as possible when I describe what happened to me almost five years ago that I've told very few people about. I hope by relating this, it might be useful in one day deciphering what is happening to some of us. I was married at the time and living in Mount Vernon, Missouri. My wife and I lived across the street from a local high school and had a habit of walking our dog every night, either around the neighborhood adjacent to our house, or we would walk down the road to the entrance to the high school and walk around the main classroom complex a couple of times and then return. Sometimes we went together and sometimes I would go along with the dog. Remember this, many, many times I've written about people disappearing with dogs, many times. When we went around the school, it usually took us about a half hour or more, as it took around 10 minutes walking at a reasonable pace to get from our front door to the school itself. That'll become an important point in a moment. One night, one night when we were out, it was windy and it felt a bit odd. I can't explain it. But it's hard to say it was odd. It just felt like we were perhaps being watched. That's not all that weird, though, as we were not isol... Ah, sorry about this. That's not all that weird, though, as we were not isolated, and anyone could have been looking out a window or watched us. I really didn't pay it any mind, but maybe I should have. As we were walking, my wife spotted a kitten next to the main high school building as we approached it. It was making a lot of noise and sounded like it might have been in distress. Our dog was, liking, our dog was acting like she wanted to eat it, so I stayed back with the dog while my wife tried the approach to pick up the kitten. Each time as she got close to the cat, within a few paces, it would back away. She told me that she thought the dog was scaring it and asked if I would take the dog and move away. <coughs> I 
I complied and led the dog around the south side of the main classroom complex and would glance over my shoulder every once in a while to see what my wife was pursuing and how much further the cat was taking her towards the tree line. I could also hear her voice calling to the kitten. I walked as far as the parking lot to the football field on the west side of the school's main complex and turned to face the direction where she was. At this point, we had only been separated for a couple of minutes when something in the sky caught my eye. There was a reddish colored orb of light moving high up towards my direction from the east. I thought it might be a light on an aircraft, but it didn't look like it and it wasn't flashing on and off. Within seconds, another orb appeared behind the first and trailed the first one. Both lights turned south and traveled in what appeared to be a fairly straight line. Then one after another, they both just disappeared. To be honest, I didn't think much of it at the time, but it did seem strange. The whole thing was done in over 30 to 45 seconds, and once the lights were gone, I suddenly realized I couldn't hear my wife's voice calling to the kitten anymore. I yelled out loudly to her, no response. I continued north around the front side of the classroom complex, yelling for her several times. Out of curiosity, I looked across her house, to which there was some distance away, and I spotted her walking on the side of the road very close to the home. I thought it was odd, because I figured she must have caught the kitten and wanted to get it back to the house as quickly as possible. The thought crossed my mind that she must have sprinted part of the distance to make it that close to the house in so little time. And the only reason I could think that she would do that is if the kitten was severely injured and she was trying to get it home to administer some kind of first aid. It took me another 10 minutes at a quick pace to get back to the home. Upon walking inside, my wife confronted me angrily, demanding where I'd been. I asked her what she meant, and she told me that she had been looking all over for me and couldn't locate me. She said that she had finally caught the kitten, then walked around the high school multiple times, both directions, yelling my name, and finally gave up, assuming I had gone home without her. I told her that what she said was impossible. Where I was standing watching those lights, she would have had to run right into me several times if she had circled the school, as she said multiple times, and I certainly would have heard her yelling my name. Not only that, but to walk around the school multiple times would have taken quite a while. It certainly would have taken longer than the few minutes she and I would have been separated by my recollection. We both kept repeating our recollections of the events to each other, trying to figure out what had happened and only managed to get more and more confused. Nothing added up. According to her, from the time she caught the kitten and began looking for me till she gave up and headed for home was 20 minutes or more. I've attached... Stop that. The questions for me remain, why did neither of us hear or see one another? Why is there such a large disparity of time? I didn't black out, the best I know. I had no sense of dementia or missing time, I never have. I was not ill, dizzy, or foggy. My wife never believed what I said about the lights and insisted I was pulling some prank on her. I continue to think about that occurrence and it disturbs me. I have not experienced anything like that since. I've read other accounts from people that have also experienced these kinds of incidents, and it makes, makes the whole thing feel more bizarre. I hope we can all figure it out someday. If you happen to share the story, please do not mention my name, but feel free to contact me. Great story. It reminds you of other stories we've talked about here. Now, in this incident, <clears throat> you've got the wife that continues back to the home and beats the husband back. So the person that was missing the time was the husband. And the husband is the one with the dog. Think about it. I'm not sure what happened here, but point of separation, missing time, lights in the sky. Don't know, it seems very hot. Folks, I'm indebted to you. Thank you for accepting me into your world. Uh, every day I will do my best for you, I promise. Uh, I appreciate the stories, <laughs> probably over 500 this week, and I can only go through a couple each time, so I'll do my best to decipher which ones to read and talk to you about, and we'll continue to bring forward these issues on missing people to you, so you have a clear understanding of what's happening. Be safe, remember to practice what I preach. If you're going to go on a hike, tell somebody where you're going. Check the weather before you leave. Always hike in pairs. Carry a backpack, extra water, extra food, personal locator beacon, a map, uh, <clears throat> some kind of trail guide. I always carry one. And if you're comfortable, carry a firearm. 
if you're an area with bear, carry bear spray. There's more things, but that's the, the briefing I'll give you today. And let's hope we see each other soon. Thank you for staying tuned.